All right, guys, welcome to week 12. I'm sure a lot of you are really excited to kind of break into um, contemporary art here. Um, almost. Um, we're at minimalism, conceptual art, process art, and land art. Uh, really getting into some of the really great artistic periods that change how we think about art and sort of uh, create our sort of contemporary landscape for the creation of art in general. So we were talking last week about pop art uh, as well as abstract expressionism and we keep thinking about all of these artistic periods where we have the focus on consumerism and we're starting to challenge all these different concepts and so what we see happening as we get closer and closer to the 1970s is abstract expressionism and modernism are being challenged. Artistic constructions are being broken down. We're rethinking how we contemplate art in the art object. And we really question the very nature of art itself. So we talked a bit last week about Clement Greenberg. And he was this art critic, right, who supported abstract expressionism and Jackson Pollock. And we have this moment here where he's become very famous. He's become really well known. And the ideas and constructs that he's created over the time of him being an art critic are really going to be broken down. So some of the ideas that Clement Greenberg supported are he defined high art, um, meaning that um, he believes certain types of art were considered high art, could be displayed in museums, while other pieces of art were quote-unquote low art. Um, he believed that any type of art from cubism to surrealism evolved following a historical logic that did not occur between not occur because of the social or political world. Um, and you can either sort of agree or disagree with that. I tend to sort of disagree in that um, when you look at these artistic periods, especially when you start looking at them during World War One and World War Two, how are those artistic movements not being influenced greatly? by the social political world. Um, Greenberg believed in some capacity that artists were just sort of geniuses or inherent geniuses. And so art sort of moved along a trajectory that it, in it inherently would with or without the politics of sort of um, the world as a whole. Agree to disagree. Um, and then art should be viewed silently against a neutral wall, um, that this would intensify the work's effect as a whole. And so he sort of developed and um, thought through this idea as he supported uh, Jackson Pollock and other male artists. And um, what we see is that Clement Bring Greenberg was highly a formalist, meaning he studied art almost exclusively through form, style, and compositional elements versus anything secondary. So while this was sort of effective at the time in talking about abstract expressionism, what we see is that this is not really the way that we talk about art today. And so when we talk about Clement Greenberg and low art, he sort of develops this idea um, about kitsch. And we sort of briefly talked about that article last week. Um, but kitsch was the product of industrialization and the urbanization of the working class, a filler made for the consumption of working class, a populace hungry for culture but without the resources and education to enjoy cutting edge and avant-garde, kitsch using for raw material the debased and academized simulacra of genuine culture welcomes and cultivates this insensibility. It is the source of its profits. Kitsch is mechanical and operates by formulas. Kitsch is vicarious experience and fake sensations. Kitsch is... Oh, awesome place. Kitsch changes according to style, but remains always the same. Kitsch is the epitome of all the spurious in life of our times. All that is spurious. Kitsch pretends to demand nothing of its customers except their money, not even their time. And so you can imagine that Clement Greenberg is writing this and talking about um, how he sees sort of high canvas painted art as part of high art and what should be displayed in museums and how he's sort of negatively talking about low art um, or even sort of uh, pop art that we talked about last week. So however what we do see is that artists had already started challenging concepts of ex abstract expressionism, modernism, and high, heart, high art as defined by Clement Greenberg. And so 
when we start talking about this, we really focus on the scholar Arthur Danto. And what Arthur Danto says is that he sees uh, The Brillo Box by Andy Warhol, which we talked about last week, for the first time in 1964. And he saw that this was a piece of high art of the pop era. This object was commercialized, made into an art object, and agreed upon art society as being high art. And this is very against what uh, Clement Greenberg is saying about art, but of course this was true. By the 1950s and the 1960s, you had pop art taking over, and this was very much sort of the consumerist objects. And whether or not you sort of agreed with Clement Greenberg in the first place, because he's saying that uh, only poor people can, like, um, kitsch or whatever the case may be, but um, that this type of art became very much sort of the norm in the 1960s. And so what Clement Greenberg said, or not Clement Greenberg, I'm sorry, what Arthur Danto said was that now the art world was going to take on this pluralism of the 1950s, that no one artistic movement could dominate. And we had really seen this anyway, right? We keep seeing all of these different modern movements, artistic movements, that are happening sort of over the top of one another. And so he decided to say that um, we have this sort of art historical pluralism that will lo no longer be overrun with just one artistic period. And so we'll see this as we move into some other um, periods as well, but all of them are kind of sort of happening over the top of one another. So he, this led him to proclaim, um, shockingly to the public, that art history was dead. Um, and what that meant was that not that um, art making and art history was dead, but that um, the way that art history had been writing about art for such a long time was not going to have sort of any place in the contemporary world as we moved forward with um, this sort of ever-expanding movement on top of movement on top of movement. So this was quite revolutionary and a lot of art historians support his work today um, in believing that this was sort of the breakdown of um, how we think about art and art history in the 1960s and the 70s, um, which is phenomenal and interesting and great and powerful um, in that art sort of took its own way um, and didn't run according to these quote-unquote historical movements that art history had sort of been obsessed with up to this point. So, um, as said in Brandon Taylor's article where this quote comes from, by this he meant not that people would stop making art or studying art, but that the idea of art progressing and evolving over time along one clear path, as it seemed to have done from the Renaissance through the late 19th century and into the first post-World War II decade, could no longer be supported by art of the late 20th century. And we saw artists, even when we started talking about pop art and abstract expressionism, a lot of this occurred because of social and political turmoil after World War II. We have the Kennedy assassination. We have the civil rights marches, the race riots in LA, the US campaign in Vietnam, um, among other different sort of political actions that were happening. And so art was really sort of changing um, and moving away um, from abstract expressionism anyway into pop art and consumerism. Um, and all these different levels of art in a lot of ways. That sort of moved against what Clement Greenberg thought um, art should be. And as I told you, I really didn't support him anyway. So we're going to look outside the USA here for a minute uh, because it's really interesting how some of these theories and ideas developed outside the USA, and then we'll come back into it as well. So Piero Manzoni is a really famous Italian artist, and he became really popular as one of these early um, minimalist artists and sort of developing minimalism, sort of this pre-minimalist artist. He went and visited Yves Klein's work, uh, Blue Monochrome, in 1961. And Klein worked with his own chemist to make a very particular color of blue and made a lot of canvases painted purely in this color. And we're going to talk about him a little next week in his performance works, not necessarily in these monochrome works. Uh, but Manzani got inspired from uh, Klein's work and ended up painting a series of what he called achromes in 1958. And these were 
paintings that were just mostly white, leaving the spectator with only the bare form of the work. The canvas was sometimes soaked in different pieces of china clay or fabric or glue, and it would make the viewer just focus on the quality of the canvas itself. So really think about the material qualities of the object and sort of the absence of color and form. And so he made quite a few of these in which he just um, produced canvas is covered in either clay um, or this one fabric and gesso which is a type of glue and made these achrome paintings um, and achrome um, he meant to stand for the, the absence of color or uncolor and so really starting to break down how we look at painting traditionally in art history. Tony was to do this a lot with art and he really continued it in a lot of different ways. So his next sort of trajectory was to create paintings or images in which he put in a tube. And so the tube in which helped the painting would say um, potentially what the image was. Like for example, this one um, features, contains a line. It would say how many meters long it was. And then it was made by Piero Manzoni. And so you would have to just take the word for what was in the image um, on the tube. So this was really revolutionary in thinking that you had to sort of take the artist's word for what he had created and put in this tube. And so um, Manzoni wrote, a surface with luminous possibilities has been reduced to sort of receptacle in which inauthentic colors, artificial expressions, press against each other. Why not empty the receptacle, liberate this surface? Why worry about the position of a line in space? Why determine this space? Why limit it? A line can only be drawn long to the infinite and beyond all problems of compositions or of dimensions. There are no dimensions in total space. And so he believed that through doing this sort of um, arts, you could rethink um, how you understand something like a line or a canvas, um, really moving beyond sort of the art object itself. So he was to continue this with objects like hard-boiled eggs from 1960, in which he signed each and every egg with a thumbprint and then invited his audience to eat them. Uh, another was to blow up a balloon, uh, which was called Artist's Breath, and um, every piece sort of reduced the artist's action to unthinking, bodily action, and the art object to nearly featureless commodity. So here, like, you just have to, again, take his word that this is his air inside a balloon, or that this is his fingerprint, um, taking sort of these objects of the artist um, and breaking them down into these sort of weird parts. So he took this to sort of his final work. Um, he died pretty young at the age of 29, but um, his sort of final and most um, crazy work of art um, is Artist Shit from 1961. So his father owned a canning factory and he produced 90 cans, each numbered and signed, which contained supposedly 30 grams of the artist's own uh, excrement. And so it was sold in the weight of gold for the time. So um, usually around like $37. And people sort of debated on whether or not it actually had poop in it or if it had gold or what was he trying to say um, in this work. Um, but eventually here, one of his works actually sold for one of these um, artist shits which would tell you when it was produced and tinned, um, sold for Christie's auction for $282,000. Um, so this was a really famous work that he did at the time. Um, there's a quote from the book, um, Brandon Taylor's book, Yet yeah, Monzoni's great legacy seems to lie in his presence, prenzient satire, a kind of art where the artist's name is crucial, while his or her direct involvement or talents seem to be immaterial and where a global art market can buy even the most lowly objects. So he's literally taking his own body, his own um, parts, right, and breaking it down and making these sort of art objects in itself. So it's really weird, it's really kind of gross, um, but he was really sort of mocking but also discussing sort of the value of an artist and what that means to sort of the art world. And he helped sort of produce the movement called Arte Povera or Poor Art in Italy, which was a group of Italian artists who really invested time into um, 
art that they could easily make and procure. So you're using like sort of natural materials or um, using your own bodily excrements, um, etc. So Piero Manzoni was really sort of the developer of this idea and other artists do it as well um, today. So you can sort of look and see other artists using their um, bodily fluids to do different types of work, um, etc. For example, you have Adrian Piper, who is a famous performance artist. She made a work called What Will Become of Me um, in 1985, in which she has, um, until her death, she will be filling honey jars with her hair and fingernails whenever she cuts them, and um, the last container will hold her cremated remains, and they're donated to, um, I believe this is MoMA, and so they have on display, right, her hair, her fingernails, um, as objects of who she is as an artist. So really, again, um, Manzoni is really one of these artists that kind of start this idea, um, and others continue it on. Povera was kept up um, by other artists like Janice Canellis in the work Untitled from 1967, in which horses were led into this gallery space and were considered to sort of act as the artist's canvas. They kind of stood around maybe more like a frame in this space and people would come and walk around. So a very interesting way of thinking about ready-mades um, by Duchamp and how this could sort of be um, an artist's constructor idea. Um, another being Giovanni Anselmo in Untitled, Untitled Sculpture That Eats from 68. This is one of his best known works in which he put a crushed head of lettuce in between two pieces of cement or granite and um, secured by a wire. And as the lettuce was allowed to dry and sort of die off, the block would fall down. And so this sculpture then would need to be fed again, meaning that you would give it a new head of lettuce. Um, and then resecure it. So a really interesting way of thinking about art and art objects at the time um, with these artists. So we're going to move on to Japan as well. Japan was a really interesting and thriving culture of art um, after World War II. And we didn't talk about Japan specifically when we talked about World War II, but you have them dealing with a lot of different political um, dilemmas in that there's the bombing of the Pearl, of Pearl Harbor in the United States, which thus, then thus led to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. And so Japan is in this sort of tumultuous era as their own after World War II and feeling sort of destroyed and defeated. And so you have some interesting art objects and productions occurring in Japan at this time. Gutai Group was founded uh, by Jori Yoshihara in 1954. And this was a very interesting group of Japanese artists who were really focused on discussing sort of um, materials and how materials affected art. So this is Jori here, Yoshihara in 1954. Uh, Gutai Art meaning concrete, does not falsify material. It brings it to life. If one leaves the material as it is, presenting it just as material, then it starts to tell us something and speak with a mighty voice. And it became sort of a tremendous scream into the material itself. So these artists really started to think about um, what materials meant in the creation of art. And you can kind of see that with Manzani and some of these other artists. And so they're starting to break down um, with sort of multimedia environments, performances, and theatrical events to look at sort of um, the production of art and material um, as well. So you have this artist Murakami breaking through paper performance in 1955. He was a forerunner of performance art that threw his body through paper screens and would break through something like 42 layers of paper, as you can see this move into space here. And he was experimenting with the relationship between anger and physical action by breaking into many sheets of paper mounted on a wooden frame, as well as breaking the manifestations of a painting's essence, um, thinking about the idea of this being a canvas and literally just breaking through all of these layers of that idea. Um, and he did this quite a bit to sort of contemplate the idea of a canvas um, as held in an art museum. He would also create works like Entrance from 55, in which this was your entrance into the gallery. You had to walk through 
um, the broken down pieces of paper that had been shattered by um, another body like his own, and that would be your entrance into a space. There were a lot of other artists also experimenting really interestingly with materials like paint, um, such as so Shozo Shimamoto. Um, he was very interesting in the violent encounters with surfaces of painting. He would create holes and cuts and different sort of um, violent wounds to the canvas itself. So he would focus like in his whole series, uh, taking sheets of newspaper topped with a sheet of brown cartridge paper and pasting them together and then creating sort of holes and jagged lines and movements through a canvas itself um, and piercing the canvas or breaking it down. Um, he would also do um, performances in which he would smash paint bottles over canvas to produce explosive patterns of energy or a cannon or um, shot glass bottles full of paint in sort of these different types of um, action painting. So they were kind of doing action painting um, very much outside of the United States um, as well and sort of creating like performances with that work. So a lot of his work is really gorgeous and interesting to look at um, in the way that they kind of express um, emotion and energy. Atsuko Tanaka was another famous Gutai group artist. She was very interesting in talking about sort of um, costuming and the like. She created electric dress in 1956, um, which she wore to exhibitions. And it came from this pharmaceutical advertisement illuminated in neon lights. And she wanted to talk about sort of the body's circulatory system through um, this sort of electric... Um, outfit that she would wear. Uh, these lights would blink sporadically, giving off the sensation of an alien-like creature, um, and talked about sort of the technology and body refused in a hallucinatory light play of the modern city. Her work symbolized post-war Japan's rapid transformation and urbanization, um, and so it was really interesting for her to sort of walk around and wear this electric dress as sort of a symbol um, of the modern era. She also did different works on stages like stage clothes from 1957 in which she would stand on a stage rapidly removing a series of bright futuristic looking chiffon and organic garments, tearing off removable panels and trick sleeves to expose new clothes underneath, changes between customized outfits designed to accentuate the notions of constraint or transformation, um, really talking about movement um, and how Japan was sort of transforming um, in a lot of ways at this time. Another artist, and the final one that I really like from this period, is Kazuo Shiraga, The Challenge to the Mud from 1955. Again, much like Jackson Pollock um, in action painting, he would create these dynamic works, um, such as this one starting with mud, in which he would move around in the mud and create um, an art object within it, and that it became this sort of battle with the mud and material itself. He would also hang himself over the tops of his canvases and would create um, marks with his feet and unique textures and swirls and splatters to exert himself um, over the tops of these paintings. And so then you would see like the final product here. Um, so I have included some videos of him and his art making because it's really fantastic to watch him sort of create art um, and move sort of sporadically over the tops of these canvases here. outside the U.S. really helped to promote and change art within the United States. And so with that, we had the change to the movement of minimalism. This movement was also known as ABC art or primary structures. Artists constructed simple geometrical objects that were characterized by formal symmetry, absence of traditional composition, and monochrome color. These works had similar formal attributes like regular symmetrical arrangements, repeated units, and industrial materials. So minimalism really came to replace um, modernism and pop art and some of these other um, artistic movements that we saw at the time.
So of course, uh, Clement Greenberg and artists like Michael Fried, uh, or critics that is, came to critique um, minimalism. So Michael Fried, who was a friend of Greenberg, attacked minimalist artists saying their work suffered from objecthood, or what Fried called literalness, which essentialized the work's presence in front of the viewer, meaning that um, these objects needed a viewer to exist, and um, without one they had no value um, or presence. So he went on to write a book called Art and Objecthood, saying that minimalist art commanded only attention, Fried suggested, modernist painting and sculpture compelled, compelled conviction. And so um, he really thought that minimalism um, needed a viewer absolutely to be sort of valued in any sort of um, way or capacity. Minimalism in a lot of ways um, was part of the protests of the Vietnam War and came out of another sort of social change in society, right? Again, sort of Clement Greenberg's ideas of art um, not being affected uh, because very much so people were against the Vietnam War and so we had protest art um, as well as minimalism coming out of this sort of um, socioeconomic society. Um, so rock music escalating and encouraging revolution, dematerializing the art object so that no longer an object that could be purchased or traded on the market, no longer the kind that could be displayed in a conventional gallery setting, no longer an entity that could be described in conventional terms. In practice, their new artifacts embodied a potent mixture of refusals, gestures, and non-events arranged in non-orthodox orthodox physical arrangements and drawing upon a motley of resources, including found objects and urban detritus, treated with bad manners and extravagant nihilism of a disaffected minority culture. So there was a real freedom of sculpture that occurred, and Robert Morris was a big figure in that, um, in his installation in Green Gallery in New York in 1964. He exhibited large-scale forms constructed out of this gray painted plywood, and objects were really stripped of their distractions, quote-unquote distractions, um, of figural or metaphorical reference, detail or ornament, and it just became the physical relationship of the object in contact with the viewer. So these objects presented no compositional complexity, no tonal variation, no clean line of demarcation between the literal space of the gallery and the viewer's own. So it was just about the interaction of the physical person with the object. And they're kind of like pieces of stage sets that you can think of, or just like this weird shape that you would interact with in the gallery, right? And it sort of breaks down the gallery space versus the art object. And Morris did this even more by having his works be made um, from traditional building materials and then commercially fabricated to the artist's specifications. So this kind of removed his hand from the work so that um, these works could be destroyed and then recreated. So he was thinking about all these basic facts um, of light, of space, um, of material, and then rethinking their value in um, the gallery space. So really breaking down what it means to make a piece of sculpture and what it then means in that gallery space. So he becomes kind of a revolutionary figure in thinking that way. Carl Andre's work was very similar um, in his production of Equivalent 8 in 1966, and he called his work three-dimensional work, and this work was very interesting. This series was that each series, um, each sculpture in the series was made of 120 bricks, um, bricks that were acquired and then arranged on the floor. It was part of a series in which each sculptural object was all made of these 120 bricks and they were all the same height, mass, and volume but every single one of them was different um, because the bricks were different and the material was different. So again dealing with um, industrial materials, so different types of bricks or different colors of bricks and so again he's working um, in sort of ready-mades in that these are industrial materials and objects and about talking about um, the environment and the relationship with that space. So when the viewer comes in, they interact with this object as a part of the space itself and a part of the building material. So this work is kind of weird and interesting and 
it was funny. I was like looking into this work again um, and thinking about it. And I found this article that was literally Carl Andre's Equivalent 8, the most boring, controversial artwork ever. Um, mostly because uh, when the Tate Modern purchased this work, um, angry conservatives were upset uh, in 1973 because he spent, uh, the Tate Gallery spent tax money to purchase this work, um, which was just a pile of bricks. But um, it was really about the conversation that we're having about breaking down what can be considered art and what artists um, can make into art, uh, etc. Donald Judd is a big figure of this as well with his modular constructions. He would do kind of these trademark stacks, each unit being identical um, and about sort of using these cold metallic structures and building sort of objects in space. Judd was using industrial materials, um, assembled pieces, and then sort of working to build these structures. His are usually maybe a little more interesting um, than Carl Andre or Robert Morris, um, just because he does a little more experimentation with color and form and kind of these um, acrylic sheets and sort of the repetition of this shape. So typically his work is maybe a little more interesting because of this color experimentation, but again, sort of removing his hand from the artwork, rethinking industrial materials as well as space um, and doing not only sort of vertical but also horizontal works like this one here. Um, this one is one of my favorites. Uh, this is me taking a picture of it, but it's really Really interesting to look through something like this and contemplate the use of space and the use of the gallery space as well. So you can also think of um, Dan Flavin as one of these artists as well. Instead of using typical industrial materials like metals or bricks, he's using light um, and the use of light and color um, to create his work. So something like this, um, pink out of the corner to Jasper Johns in 1963, in which he illuminates a corner, which is not something you would usually illuminate in a gallery space. And so he was thinking about sites and how gallery space determined his work and how an, um, a viewer would encounter this object itself and rethinking sort of um, this work as a whole. And he connected it to Jasper Dons because he felt he similarly blur boundaries between real objects and their representation. And he sort of became known as the electric tube man because of all the different lights and um, ways that he configured them in space. So what does this come down to when you look at minimalism and its sort of role in the movement from modern to contemporary art? Um, you have to think about what is an art object, what is its value. Um, we have seriality, repetition, assemblage, and then the role of the viewer. And the role of the viewer becomes big in conceptual art, in process art, um, land art, and then performance art because it's challenging the notion of a self-sufficient art object, like a painting um, that can stand on the wall. And even when you're not there, right, it's still a painting, it's still an object um, it has intrinsic value, but um, minimalist objects require and need a viewer. So if you had something like that brick sculpture um, by Carl Andre, it, it becomes an art object by being placed in the gallery and viewed as such. It became controversial at the time, could be dependent on a viewer for completion of work, but this was part of destabilizing um, visual art and the refocus on the context, social, cultural, or political ideas at the time. So we're breaking down what is an art object, what could be considered an art object. And I know that this doesn't seem necessarily revolutionary to us today, but in the 50s, in the 60s, this was shocking, this was revolutionary to think that um, an art object could be anything like a piece of metal um, by Donald Judd or light by Flavin work in minimalism leads us to conceptual art, where they continue to sort of break down and dematerialize the art object. So the concept of art priority over actual media, artists as thinker versus object maker is a big part of that. Um, critiquing the social position of artists challenges passive viewers and museums as institution of social and economic power. Work not necessarily there to satisfy the viewer, Work couldn't be bought and sold in commercially driven gallery system. Uh, this was an attempt, but you know, always sort of, you can sort of get around this um, in some capacity.
And Solowit was a big part of this. He stated conceptual art is only good when the idea is good. And so it really came to qualifying anything as an object. And any object could be art. Not every object is art. What infused into a piece, what is an audience gain from it, is key to the status of art. Conceptual art, which shifted the balance of production, form, from material to idea, from event to concept, was not, of course, completely free of material, but the place of that material with the system of viewing, buying, selling, and conserving art was for a time, roughly between 66 and 72, radically at odds with the prevailing assumption about aesthetic encounter. So you had great scholars like Solowit, like Lucy Lipper, John Chandler coming together and discussing the dematerializing of art and the art object um, itself. And so Solowit did this in some of his work. Um, his work is very minimalist in a lot of ways um, and sort of on the brink of this minimalist versus conceptual art. Um, I would say line, but he really revolution revolutionized our perception of the art object in work like this, um, which is wall drawing 337 and 338, in which these were drawings um, on the walls of galleries that then those works could be physically produced by someone else. So he created his idea and the written instruction for that work and then believed someone else could then physically make the work. So believe that idea itself could be a work of art and maintain that like an architect who creates a blueprint for a building and then turns the project over to a construction crew, an artist should be able to conceive of a work and then either delegate its actual production to others or never make it at all. So he could have sort of these diagrams for the creation of art that would lead to his art being produced um, literally. So he did a lot of seriality with that hierarchy like Donald Drudd using standardized cubes um, as well as um, traditional colors and materials. Other artists pushed this even further. This is Joseph Kosuth's One in Three Chairs from 65. This was a really valuable and important work because it discussed and thought about um, art and the language of art itself. So art as thought or perception. So when you look at this, you see a photograph of a chair, you see a physical chair, and then you see a definition of a chair. And so when you go and you look at an object, um, which one is really a chair, right? It same as when you think about Rene Magritte, and this is not a pipe. You think, oh, well, is a definition of a chair a chair? Is a picture of a chair a chair? Is the literal chair a chair? Or is this just a ready-made object put here that's not being used as a chair because it's in an art space? So really thinking about what is real, what is not real, what does your mind make when it thinks about objects, right? You can start thinking about Foucault and all of these different philosophers and scholars who are thinking about what really makes an art object or a physical object. So really breaking down these constructs, um, which is brilliant. He did a lot of these types of series. Robert Berry was another really famous conceptual artist. Um, this is the work Iterant Gas Series from 1969. Uh, this work just lives in this photograph, and it was the releasing of two cubic feet of helium into an open space of the Mojave Desert and photographing this result. So again, this photograph is a documentation of this, but the art object, the art performance, is him literally releasing an invisible gas into a desert, right? So just thinking about the process and the idea of making this object and then photographing it and then seeing this is the art that I produced out in the desert um, with gas and the earth, right? Robert Berry would break this down even more in some of his interesting exhibitions um, and gallery work, such as 88 MC Carrier Wave from October of 1968. So he can't, he started challenging kind of the object, art object context and viewer. And in this gallery, it had two small wall labels that showed he had work in the gallery. Um, but that was it. And sort of like this, I know these are kind of blurry. Um, but this, um, exhibition consists of radio waves generated by hand engineered FM radio transmitter installed in the gallery but hidden from view and it was first presented in 1969. 
When amplified through a transmitter radio, tuned to a specific FM frequency, the waves produce t tones and sounds of varying intensity depending on the strengths of the signal. The project challenged long-held assumptions about what defines a work of art and expanded traditional notions of sculpture, positing that sound as well as objects can define a space. So it became that people would walk into this space that held no sort of physical art objects, but you could hear um, this radio that was hidden from view um, sort of transmitting itself through the space itself. Robert Berry would take things further and further, um, such as this, which was um, an ad taken out in the, in the newspaper called Telepathic Piece. During an exhibition, I will try to communicate telepathically a work of art, the nature of which in a series of thoughts that are not ap applicable to language or image. He had a um, specification or wall label printed out for the London Exhibition in 1969 that literally said there is something very close in place and time but not yet known to me and that what his that was what his art object and contribution to the exhibition was was this um, line that he wrote and finally his closed exhibition of 1969 in that um, the exhibition he had planned in Amsterdam would consist of the gallery staff locking the door and posting an announcement that read for the exhibition the gallery will be closed. So again Robert Berry is very complicated in his thinking of how you break down the art object to literally sort of ideas and concepts and rethinking sort of the value of art objects at all and going so far as to post things in newspaper to write wall labels that reference nothing physical in the gallery right sort of commenting on all of these structures that we consider to have power or meaning um, and to sort of take them totally out of our hands to make us feel like we have no power um, in some capacity. Hans Hock is a big figure in this as well with his condensation cube of 65 in which um, art became sort of a sense of the physical system in which you had the physical process of evaporation and condensation of water within changing temperatures outside and inside would affect um, his cube and that was the art object itself um, as a sort of a living system but also the viewer as sort of connected with it, right? The more viewers and people you have in the space most likely the hotter the area and then the hotter the cube, which causes it then to condensate, right? Kind of think about the physical body um, or the sort of reaction to temperature. Hans Hock was really known for sort of breaking down and thinking about sort of elements um, of using art to critique institutions. In his work, this is Shapolsky et al., Manhattan Real Estate Holdings, A Real-Time Social System, as of May 1st, 1971. He made this landmark work which chronicled slumlords over the course of two decades. So he took pictures, he took accounts um, of people, he took about 146 photographs of Manhattan apartment buildings and documented real estate transactions and text and information and really broke down how Shapolsky, like other um, realtors at the time were taking advantage of people and creating these slumlord locations. And so he spent all this time documenting these um, apartment buildings and writing down the foibles of sort of these slumlords and then displaying it as art, right? It was this kind of social critique of society, something he felt that couldn't be commodified, right? That you wouldn't want to purchase something uh, that's an apartment building picture with transactions. Of course, these things were eventually commodified by the museum nonetheless. But um, critiquing the social systems outside the museum and then bringing it into the context of the museum itself. He did this even further with something like MoMA Poll from 1970. Uh, he didn't release this question until he... Um, until the day of the exhibition and it was very sort of controversial because it posed this question would the fact that governor rockefeller has not denounced president nixon's indochina policy be a reason for your not voting for him in november so and people came and they voted and the big sort of critique of this work um, was that Nelson Rockefeller at the time was a major donor and board member of MoMA and 
um, they were questioning his support of the Vietnam War. So you have all these viewers and all these visitors to the museum, and they're being asked to sort of choose whether or not they support or do not support um, the Vietnam War and being asked this by outing Rockefeller as a supporter of the war. And so, of course, pe most people um, at this time were against the Vietnam War, and so there were about twice as many yes votes as there were no, it would affect their voting for him in November. And many of these artists um, and the museums wanted to sort of move, remove pieces by Hans Hock, um, but there was the constant um, conversation about artist censorship and not allowing these works to be taken down, right? And so again, this is about artists as thinker versus artists as object maker. He's not, these aren't objects or art objects that are aesthetically pleasing, that are um, traditional paintings or sculptures, but they are these installations that people interact with and comment on sort of society as a whole, um, like Rockefeller's support of the Vietnam War and how that affects your feeling about MoMA as an institution. So this, this really came about during a time where artists as well as um, figures in general were creating institutional critique. And uh, viewers started thinking about art institutions, galleries, and museums and thinking about how they're sort of the propagators of culture and idea. Um, artwork reworked and reframed in whatever context the museum desires. Everything is exploited for profit. Institutional critique makes visible boundaries between inside and outside, private and public. Taste is institutionally created. And it became associated with artists like Asher, Brothers, Daniel Buren, Andrea Frazier, who we're going to talk about, um, as well as Hans Hock, right, in his work that we just looked at. So artists, as well as viewers, are questioning how much you can rely on the museum and sort of the dialogue they're producing. And you start to think about this because you have a lot of artists who are not white, who are not male, not being displayed in museums. So you start thinking about what that critique is and what um, an institution actually says about you as an individual. So larger institutions finance from the public purse were accused of political conservatism, convert commercial entanglement, covert, and the active discouragement of ethnic minorities, the working classes, and women. Art functions as a counterweight to power throughout history. How are museums defining art history within their display of objects? So again, you can think back to Clement Greenberg and his support of Jackson Pollock. He is a white man supporting another white man in his um, focus on abstract expressionism, and he becomes powerful and strong figure in the artistic community because the institution says so, right? Clement Greenberg says his art is good, and thus the institution supports it, or people with money are the ones that can make taste. So Andrea Fraser becomes a big proponent of that um, in her work, in breaking down the critique of that work, um, like in her work Little Frank and His Cart from 2001. I've included the video in the links, uh, in which she walks around the Guggenheim Museum in Balboa, listening to an official audio guide, and sort of does everything that the audio guide says she should do, such as starting to have sort of um, a sexual interaction with the museum itself. So you can go ahead and watch that. Um, but some of her other work um, that connects a little more um, obviously with institutional critique is Museum Hi Highlights, a gallery talk in which she posed as a fictional docent named Jane Castleton. And she would leave guests around in different museums and um, would give them a tour. And of course, she would sort of exaggerate ideas um, lead tours through galleries, but also restrooms and museum stores and cafeteria, discuss corporate and private censorship and perception of relationship with museums. Um, and this led many people to sort of think about a museum in a different way. So she really wanted to break down um, how people view museums and what sort of these um, docent talks and how they kind of reveal uh, the power structures of the museum itself. Uh, Fraser does not critique just the institution of the museum. By extension, she also analyzes the type of viewer the museum produces and the process of identification that artists embody. So she would make people rethink um, galleries and spaces um, and who owns them and their value uh, with these kind of exhibitions um, and performances.
um, Andrea Frazier said about institutional critique, no matter how public, emplacement, immaterial, transitory, relational, everyday, or even invisible, what is announced and perceived as art is always already institutionalized simply because it exists within the perception of participants in the field of art as art. To the extent that a site is understood as a set of relations, institutional critique aims to transform not only the substantive, visible manifestations of those relations, but their structure, particularly what is hierarchical in that structure, and the forms of power and domination, symbolic and material violence produced by those hierarchies. And she eventually led um, herself to think about um, how institutional critique became institutionalized, right? So over time, um, institutional critique, like the works of Hans Hock, have been purchased by museums and thus have become part of the institution. And so she talks about how we are the institution of art, the object of our critiques, our attacks, is always also inside ourselves. And so in this land of global markets and mega museums, you have to also consider who you are as a viewer and how much you are a participant um, in the institution itself. Uh, and she's sort of shameful that she had some part in the development of this phrase because it's become part of this like pithy catchphrase that museums can use. But it's also a question of what kind of institution we are, what kind of values we institutionalize, what forms of practice we reward, and what kind of rewards we aspire to. So I know this is a lot of information about institutional critique, but it's a big part of how you understand conceptual and process art and land art and performance art because people start wanting to critique museums to not be involved in museum culture because it has such a monetary, hierarchical, racial view of society as a whole, and people want to break away with that, from that in general. So you can think about the Guerrilla Girls um, and other big groups like Art Workers Coalition as well. Um, there were so many pre-Guerrilla Girls uh, groups that worked to get open representation in museums and pressure museums to make a larger reform in who they display, like women, like people of color. And so they would go in and they would post posters about demonstrating and supporting black artists, demanding museums expand their activities into all areas and communities, um, forcing free admission days so that all people have access to galleries, um, they would post 13 demands, all these different ways that they feel like museums should reform their practices, um, as well as sort of creating revolutionary work um, of sort of activism. Art Workers Coalition was called Am Babies from 1970, and it was a poster um, protesting the Vietnam War and the My Lai Massacre, um, in which babies and women were left in the street dead by American soldiers. And it came from an interview um, with a soldier in the Vietnam War. Um, this is a partial transcript of the Mike Wallace interview with Paul Medlow, in which he describes his participation in the massacre. So you fired something like 67 shots? Right. And you killed how many at that time? Well, I fired them automatic, so you can't... You just spray the area on them, and so you can't know how many you killed, because they were going fast. So I might have killed 10 or 15 of them. Men, women, and children? Men, women, and children. And babies? And babies. And so when you look at this um, image, it was from that massacre in which um, American soldiers slaughtered Vietnam um, individuals who they believed were part of um, sort of hiding... Uh, Vietnamese soldiers at the time. And so MoMA had originally agreed to fund the support of these images, but um, Rockefeller and Pei Lee were both supporters of the Vietnam War, and so the museum claimed that it was outside the function of the museum to produce this work. And thus the Art Workers Coalition uh, printed that work on their own and protested it um, in front of Guernica, which of course is sort of an image of the horrors of war, and thus sort of commenting on the Vietnam War and um, what the museum's position should be in taking up ideas like this, right? Is a museum allowed to say that it's outside of their purview to display something like this because people who finance them support the Vietnam War?
A lot of this conceptual art led into ideas about process art, uh, which are connected intrinsically, um, that emphasize the process of making art versus the actual object that it creates in the end. So um, figures like Eva Hesse are a big figure in this. Um, also Robert Norris and Bruce Nauman and Richard Serra. You can think about them as well. Um, Eva Hesse was well known for her work um, because she would make these sort of um, tangled sculptures like this entitled row piece works like this out of um, latex over rope string and wire and would tangle um, these sort of tangled strings and um, materials would be placed in a gallery space and it was about the process of making it and hanging it in the museum so you would she would give instructions to the museum on how to hang it and that it could be in 13 different points but they could all be created differently um, and then it couldn't be repeated sort of perfectly in any other spaces and so she would included a description like hung irregularly, tying knots as, as connections, really letting it go as, as it will, allowing it to determine more of the way it completes itself. So really about um, displaying this work of hers, um, but the process of making it and displaying it in the gallery is more important than the finished product of the way that each installation looks. And she made it so that it couldn't be sort of repeated um, the exact same way in every space. Richard Long was a big part of this as well. Um, this is his work, A Line Made by Walking from 1967, in which he literally walked back and forth and back and forth across a space with a stick and made this line in the ground. And he photographed the work as part of recording his physical interaction with the landscape. But it was just about the process of walking back and forth. It wasn't about the actual creation of the line or the physical line that could be sold um, or thought of as a museum object, but that the process of him making it with his own body. So very much so this leads into our conversations about environmental art, about earthworks, about artists really interacting with environments and spaces as part of their art. So um, there are a lot of different types of land art and earthworks. Uh, site art, we're going to talk about all of these different ideas but really thinking about how these artists are going to transition into thinking about how they can produce those objects literally outside of the museum space that cannot be bought and purchased and commodified. So in the 60s and 70s, you have a lot of these works being created. It is about the intersection of architecture and sculpture, the creation of site-specific work, natural and organic materials, including the land itself, uh, it could be destructive, ritualistic, conceptual, ephemeral, ephemeral meaning um, that it wouldn't last like a line drawn in the ground. It'll eventually disappear um, with sort of nature taking over. And of course, the documentation through photography was a big one um, because artists often documented what they had created because it was ephemeral and wouldn't last. And thus the photography became the only image of that work itself. Now, the reason that artists started creating this type of work um, was there was a widespread concern about pollution, the depletion of natural resources, and toxic waste because of widespread industrialization. And so it brought a lot of environmental issues to national attention and dialogue. We had big events like the Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969 that really changed artists to rethinking um about the environment as a place to create art and create conversation. It was really the biggest oil spill at the time with 80 to 100,000 barrels of crude oil spilled off the channel in Southern California. And it killed about 3,500 seabirds, dolphins, seals, sea lions, etc. So it became this really monumental moment um, that created the National Environmental Policy Act in 1969 in which rethinking um, about federal agencies and their need to evaluate the environmental effects of their actions in building roads, um, etc. So just like process art and conceptual art and minimalism, we have spectator participation, a big part of it. So encouraging the spectator, they often have to participate and go to the work um, for it um, to be valued and considered and thought out. 
as well as institutional critique. So again, moving outside of museums and gallery spaces. And although they would remove the location from public access, um, it wouldn't allow people to sort of commodify the works. There was still some capacity for people to go and visit some of these earthworks, but maybe you'd only see it in a photograph. So a lot of different ways that you can think about institutional critique as well as spectator participation. Michael Heiser is a big figure in earth art. He really develops earth art with Walter de Maria, who we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. But he was influenced by archaeologists, family members, as well as geologists, grandfather, and really started creating works outside of the gallery space um, as artistic objects. So one of his first ones uh, is double negative from 67 to 70. He went into the American Southwest and made this site um, in the desert in which he cut two huge deep cuts in Nevada in the sandstone um, and composed this sort of voided space. So versus creating something um, material, he creased, created something immaterial, right? A emptiness of space um, and then like a sculptor with the lack of land. Right. So he challenged the concerns of sculpture, the dependence on the museum system um, by literally sort of carving away space and creating this shape in the desert um, that nobody really goes to. Right. It's kind of a weird um, art object. It kind of exists right in this landscape in Nevada. And so you can go and visit it. You can go and think about it, but really about contemplating Earth and um form as an artistic object right and you can sort of walk um through these spaces and think about sort of how he created this um space as sort of a challenge to um the constructs of art and um art objects there's is a great website that you can take a look at this work and kind of um think about it because i know that this is sort of a weirder um piece of earth art but it's really fun to go and look at double negative um, and to really zoom in on it and get a sense of what it looks like in this space um, because it's a really interesting work and to think about sort of um, creating a lack to create a space um, with his double negative work. By Michael Heiser is Levitated Mass from 2012 that's outside the Museum of LACMA. Again, this is a piece of earthwork that has been commodified by the museum and museum culture, but this work was a 340-ton boulder sculpture placed above um, a pathway to allow for 365-degree viewing. And this boulder was brought from about 160 miles away at a quarry. And you're supposed to sort of contemplate uh, this piece of earth or this heavy object sort of floating above you, thinking about the boulder versus the cityscape um, and what it sort of means in, as a whole. Um, kind of about the power of such a large object hanging above you. It kind of feels precarious um, and scary, but also at the same time sort of exhilarating to walk under such a large object. Um, so really about thinking and contemplating the earth um, in some capacity. Walter de Maria, as I said, with Michael Heiser, sort of created earth art and earthwork. Um, he created Lightning Field in 1977 in New Mexico. And this work is situated in the desert um, of New Mexico and it has about 400 precision poles created in this grid um, across this desert site. And the poles are supposed to draw in electricity. So the idea is that you could go and stay on this space um, and interact with the poles, interact with this field um, that's been sort of maintained by the Dia Art Foundation. And you could potentially see different types of weather interact with these poles, um, like the lightning striking the pole itself. So it's supposed to bring down electricity, bring down sort of um, weather effects in this large piece of sort of deserty area in New Mexico. So thinking about... Um, the earth and material and um, connecting with nature as well. Nancy Holt is another figure who's supported by the DF Out Foundation. Um, she created these sun tunnels in 73 and 76, which are these four concrete cylinders that are 18 feet in length and 9 feet in diameter and arranged to format 
um, arranged in a format to frame the sun on the horizon during summer and winter solstices. So I have a video that you can go and watch um, here on YouTube where you can get the sense of how um, each one of these tubes at some point frames the sun in the center of it. So again, the connection between nature and art um, and earthworks um, and sort of seeing nature in a different way um, in something like her work. Robert Smithson, Smithson is probably the most well-known um, land artist or earth artist um, because of his production of Spiral Jetty, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, but he is really sort of one of the most famous um, earth artists because of his sort of conversations about um, sites and non-sites that he created in his work. So Robert Smithson, Smithson created these non-sites um, in 1968 and did a variation on this series in which he would go and collect rocks, minerals, and earth from different types of specific, specific sites and places, and then he would put them in these little boxes uh, in the gallery space. And he would use maps and photos where the, the materials were collected to sort of frame the actual site of the collection. And it became this new type of sculpture that related to the object and to a specific location in a landscape, but brought it into the landscape of the museum. So he started doing this to sort of break down some ideas about earth art and land art and kind of challenging um, what was present in the landscape and how we talk about landscape as well as art. And then it would splinter the viewers thoughts and minds to inside and outside the gallery. So thinking about um, these sites as sort of physical sites where these objects have come from and then the replacing of the site um, within the gallery itself. So he did a lot of different versions of this um, and you can read a lot of um, scholarship that he published on non-sites and his idea of non-sites. But of course his most famous work is Spiral Jetty. I have included a um, YouTube video here of um, Smithson sort of recording some of his creation of Spiral Jetty. But um, he saw some mining equipment that had been left behind um, when a company failed to extract oil from this location. And he kind of felt this connection with the environment's ability to endure. And so he used some industrial construction equipment to haul about 15, um, a 1500 foot long spiral jetty made up about 6,000 tons of basalt rocks. So he created this um, spiral structure out of the rocks and the limestone um, and different materials in that area at the Great Salt Lake um, in Utah. And he was inspired to create this shape from um, the actual salt crystals themselves that he felt were kind of in a spiral shape. And so he um, kind of drew out and crafted this 1500 foot long coil in the middle of the Great Salt Lake here and built it up with um, the mud, the salt rocks, the basalt, um, water, etc. He also felt a connection not only to the salt crystals and the landscape in general, but also felt that um, this sea, the Great Salt Lake, it would turn this kind of blood red color um, during different times due to the bacteria and algae that thrive in the lake's north arm. And so he felt this kind of inherent connection to the primordial sea and to the past and to um, thoughts of kind of archaic ideas, this kind of blood red color. Um, and so he felt some of this connection to this landscape because of the changing color as well kind of felt like with the combination of the spiraling as well as sort of the red color um, that he felt that it was very poetic and mythical um, and so it inspired this um, earthwork for him. Here are some of the salt that builds up on the rocks um, depending on the time of year so you can get the sense of how much salt comes into play with kind of this form as a whole and this work is available to viewers. People can come and see it, um, but I have heard that it's kind of hard to travel to um, a little bit, but you can imagine people sort of trekking to this area, to this place in the Great Salt Lake to see this structure, um, which is really outside of any kind of art community um, or idea of a museum, right? Very much sort of a reflection on the earth and the focus on creation um, and thinking about this work. <laughs> 
It's also interesting because this work at different times of the year can be kind of totally submerged in the Great Salt Lake and then can sort of come up through the water as well, depending on drought or on sort of normal precipitation. So there are different ways that people can interact with, with spiral jetty depending on like the time of year. So if you look at it like this, this is completely different than um, when it's completely out of the water, right? So the different ways you can interact with this work that you wouldn't be able to experience um, if it was in a museum or something like that. Dennis Oppenheim is another really great site art artist slash earth artist that focus on sight and context. Um, he did a lot of these really interesting, very ephemeral works, such as annual rings, in which he enlarged patterns of the tree's growth and shoveled pathways in the snow that kind of transposed these annual rings into the frozen waterways. Um, and he did this on the border um, between the U.S. and Canada. And so he was kind of thinking about the relational values um, between the ordering systems that we live by, right, like the divisions of borders, and then how we count sort of the age of a tree based on its rings. So contemplating some of these ideas um, relating to sight um, and nature as well. Arnott is a really interesting artist as well. This is his self-burial um, television interference project from 1969. He was part of the British conceptual art scene and fascinated with these different works in which art was created in a natural landscape but left no trace for the presence behind and so he decided to bury himself in earth and there were a series of photographs broadcast on German television in October of 1969 and one photo was shown each day for two seconds sometimes interrupting whatever program was being shown at the time and it wasn't announced it wasn't explained um, and it was really about him um, talking about the continual reference to the disappearance of the art object suggested to me the eventual disappearance of the artist himself. So again, playing with some of these constructs of earth art and land art and site art, um, as well as sort of moving outside of the museum and maybe questioning whether or not um, an artist has sort of any purpose um, in contemporary society. He said in an interview with Susan Butler, what intrigued me about the process of recording the artworks with photography was the discrepancy between the imagined result and the actual result. So the photograph was to become instead of a second order work, the first order work, the end product. So really um, an interesting sort of um, work and collaboration with art and um, um, land art. I find this photograph so funny. Anna Mendieta is also a really famous earth artist. This is Silhouetta from 1978. She's a Cuban-American performance artist and best known for her earth um, slash body artwork. She used the outline of her naked figure into the natural landscape, talking about sort of bodily image, um, the connection with Mother Nature, and using sort of these materials like mud, sand, and grass to sort of talk about um, her connection with the earth um, and the physicality between the landscape and her female body. I've been carrying out a dialogue between the landscape and the female body based on my own silhouette. I believe this has been a direct result of my having been torn from my homeland, Cuba, during my adolescence. I am overwhelmed by the feeling of having been cast from the womb, nature. My art is the way I reestablish the bonds that unite me to the universe. It is a return to the material source. The maternal source, sorry. And so very much so with her projects, she's connecting her physical body with the earth um, and thus creating art um, through this connection. So very differently from how sort of these other artists are responding and creating objects within um, the art world uh, and in nature, like cutting out parts of a cliff or creating concrete structures, right? She's using her physical body as a reflection of nature. Um, and she would use all sorts of materials. This is her using blood to make her silhouette um, on this cloth, as well as fire. So really engaging with all these types of um, natural resources and natural elements.
Now, part of land art and earth art is this site-specific art, and this had to sort of do with the critique of modern sculpture in the arts. Um, modern art objects were transportable and could exist in the museum space, thus making them objects of commodica commodification, and they wanted to address critically content and context of site, where artists made a work of art for a specific space. If removed from that space, then the work was destroyed. So Richard Serra is a big sort of artist of site-specific art. Um, specifically, this is Tilted Arc from 1981, which is a very famous work of his. And um, he commissioned, he was commissioned to do this work by the Arts and Architecture Program of the U.S. General Services Administration to create this sculpture in the Federal Plaza in New York City. And it was this very famous plaza. Um, a lot of different business people walked through it during their lunch break and sort of interacted with that space. And so he created this space as a way to sort of make people stop and think about the location that they were located in and to sort of rethink their life and rethink their connection to the to the object itself. Um, Richard Serra wrote, the viewer becomes aware of himself and of his movement through the plaza. As he moves, the sculpture changes. Contraction and expansion of the sculpture result from the viewer's movement. Step by step, the perception not only of the sculpture, but of the entire environment changes. So it became this famous work. However, um, there were a lot of business people uh, who found the work quite hideous, um, in which I tend to agree as not a big fan of Richard Serra. But everyone kind of wanted it to get relocated because they felt like it cut up this plaza and it was kind of this big eyesore. Um, there were some complaints that it attracted graffiti and rats um, and even terrorists who might use it for bombs, um, whichever argument that may be. But um, Richard Serra said that you cannot move this work, that it would ruin it, that it was this site-specific work that he made for this plaza, and if you moved it to a different location, it would completely ruin it. So there was um, a court case in which um, people of the city were trying to get it removed, and they did eventually win, and on March 15th of 1989, it was removed and thrown away. Um, and Sarah believed much um, as other people do in site-specific art, that um, you cannot remove sort of site-specific art from its um, purpose. So he wrote, I don't think it is the function of art to be pleasing. He comments at the time, art is not democratic. It is not for the people. Other works by Sarah are in Sarah are in permanent collections of museums around the world. So he wasn't really interested in sort of um, pleasing the people of the plaza, but they did eventually win in having it removed. And again, his work does rust and get kind of this old look that's kind of grody and dirty. And I don't know how much I feel like it's a good use of um, this space to have this big object, but um, if you like it, uh, I. Um, I understand. Moving on, we have Mel Bachner, and this is Measurement Series. A lot of artists were playing with the critique um, of spaces and these conceptual artists and institutional critique. So this one, for example, by Bachner, exposes the structure of the museum itself by having the physical architecture framed as the art. And so we have these sort of little framing devices that measure out this entire space. Um, and so it could not be reproduced in any other space because it was measured exactly for this space and for this gallery as a representation of art in rethinking the gallery space. Michael Asher is a big part of um, site art as well and sort of removing spaces in galleries that are site specific to that specific gallery. So for example, this is untitled from 74 in which he took away the walls between the office and the gallery space, literally trying to um, open up the quote unquote power of the art world to connect with the physical gallery space itself. So bringing the office and bringing the people who make the galleries and who curate it right into the gallery space itself. He also did works like Santa Monica Museum of Art, where he rebuilt every temporary wall that they had built for all these exhibitions to show this sort of history of um, the structure and how much uh, change had gone through this one particular space. <laughs> 
The final sort of site artist that we're going to talk about um, is Christo and Jean-Claude, and they're a um, couple duo, kind of like uh, Joseph and Annie Albers, but they collaborated um, on all of their art, and they were born on the same day in June, on June 13th of 1935. And they even flew in separate planes, just in case one crashed, so the other can continue their work, which is pretty crazy. Um, Jean-Claude wasn't included on um, in the work until later as being sort of a female um, figure in this group, but luckily she has been um, included with her husband, Christo. So much site-specific art, and unfortunately we don't get to look at a ton of it, um, but I want to give you sort of two sort of specific examples. So this is Running Fence, which is one of their most famous works, and a lot of their works are about taking the natural world and built environment to sort of um, physically alter them in some capacity so that they make the viewers perceive and understand the locations with a new appreciation of their formal, energetic, and volumetric qualities. So really thinking about taking a space and making someone rethink it. So Running Fence, for example, um, was this massive um, fence that was created out of fabric and supported by steel posts and steel cables, and it was all run by um, volunteers and they had to sort of go through the countryside where this work ran and get all of these different people to approve that this fence could run through um, their land. So about 59 different families of ranchers sort of had to prove all of these different pieces of the fence that went up. So while there was a little bit of controversy about this um, and how much they were allowed to do or not allowed to do, they were able to move this fence all through the space in California um, and really sort of cut the space in this different way that allowed people to think and rethink their space sort of in a different capacity um, because of this sort of flooring gorgeous fence um, that Christo and Jean-Claude built in this landscape. This is another work, this is Gates from Central Park, in which they created these very orange, um, gorgeous little um, flag sections that went around um, all the areas in Central Park um, and really gave this sort of fun and new interest to the landscape um, with the bright color that was there even sort of in the winter. So a new sort of area for people to interact um, and to rethink that the space that they um, called home in New York City. I think it's one of their more, one of the most gorgeous works that they have, um, really, even when you look at it from far away. Now, I do want to touch ever so briefly on the New York graffiti scene, because it is coming um, quite prevalently during this time in New York City, and it's I think it has a very specific connection to site-specific art um, because this is a movement that specifically happens in New York um, on the subway trains. And so I want to sort of talk a little bit here about the New York graffiti scene and sort of touch on it ever so briefly. So really before 1965, graffiti art was really linked up with gang rela relations and had its own sort of history and traditions. But in the 1970s, um, a lot of graffiti art um, becomes popular between sort of the youth of the city and they start using it as um, a form of conversation and art um, and claiming and tagging, etc. So in the mid 1960s into the 70s, we have tagging sort of evolving, um, which is that people would sort of claim um, their location or want to see how many places they could put their name. So there were a lot of different artists like Taki 183, Tracy 168, Barbara 62, and Ava 62. And this had to do with the place in which these individuals lived. So for example, Taki 183, Taki lived on 183rd Street in Washington Heights. So you'd either put your last name or a nickname and then um, the street that you lived on. And so this became sort of a popular um, thing to do and really encouraged artists to start sort of communicating with one another and using these tags. Um, there was also the propagation of wild style, uh, which is a type of style that's um, 
sort of the greatest artistic challenge for a graffiti writer, writer because it's a form of writing that is hard to read. And so it's very much sort of um, to be interpreted and understood by people who are in the community um, that can read it, that have a good sense of style. And it was also about getting um, a reputation for having the best wild style. So there are a lot of different things going on in um, the graffiti art scene that I won't be able to talk about. But in the 1970s, tagging really evolved quickly into a full movement. And in the 70s, individuals are traveling from the Bronx to Brooklyn and challenging each other using a free and unique language based on typography and comic books as well as pop culture. And of course, it was a big part of the iconography of the hip hop movement. And then it starts to slow down in the 80s. Um, because it starts to appear in galleries, and then we start calling it quote-unquote street art. So it took about five years to turn tagging into a full movement, and then by the 80s, um, it had kind of completely dwindled. So a lot of the tagging and graffiti occurred on the subways, and there was a lot of sort of controversy with this, with different... Um, politicians and police office try, trying to get these kids to stop, um, even though they weren't hurting anybody physically and it kept people out of a lot of trouble. It was, of course, vandalism and technically illegal. Um, but it became this great artistic movement where you had artists like Lee Quinones, Fab Five Freddy, Lady Pink, Futura, and all these really different artists participating in groups um, and creating these great artistic works on the sides of trains. And so there was figures like Mary Martha Cooper who went around and photographed these because obviously they don't exist anymore. This is sort of very ephemeral, site-specific art. Um, and all of these individuals were part of the Fab Five, um, which is why he's called Fab Five Freddy. You can see them engaging in like Warhol pop art um, and some of these sort of playful colors. Uh, and the use of different typography and really engaging with all these new artistic techniques that are coming out because of taggy, tagging and graffiti art. So in this underground society, we have a lot of artists coming to sort of hang out. Um, in New York City, because of graffiti, because of the art scene, we have all of these artists coming together and spending time together and partying together. So you have like Futura and Kenny Scharf and Madonna and Yoko Ono and Boy George and Roy Lichtenstein and Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, Keith Haring. Um, did I say Andy Warhol? No, Andy Warhol. He's right there. So you have all of these artists that are coming together, that are collaborating. Um, in this sort of intense landscape that hadn't really existed before. And at the start of 1980, we have the Times Square show that's organized by the Collaborative Projects, or Collab, and they bring together all of these different graffiti artists who will soon become street artists um, as they sort of exhibit their art um, in gallery spaces and usually get commissions instead of sort of illegally um, creating works on the sides of walls, though it could go either way. Um, so two big figures are Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat, and we're going to talk about them here very briefly. Um, but I think that they're very much so um, site-specific artists, especially Keith Haring. So Jean-Michel Basquiat really gains a lot of fame um, really early on in his life, and um, his work took off because of his connection with sort of African-American culture and thinking about sort of some of the race issues that were happening in New York City at the time. Um, he also ha started a um, non-romantic relationship with Andy Warhol, who he idolized, and him and Andy Warhol started to work together and thought about sort of um, media and street art um, and that sort of thing. And so... There are a lot of different themes and ideas expressed in Jean-Michel Basquiat's work, um, which we don't really get to talk about, but um, I wanted to talk about one work that he produced um, in which he painted an image after the death of Michael Stewart, who was a black graffiti artist who arrested and dies from injuries sustained during arrest by New York Transit Police for spray painting graffiti on the subway. And so 
this became a really popular topic because he was just a young black artist on the street um, like everyone else who was graffitiing at the time and he was beaten and kicked to death by 11 police officers um, and he died at the age of 25 and so Basquiat created this work um, the death of Michael Stewart um, with these traffic cops here and um, Basquiat, even though he had gained a lot of fame and he was making hundreds of millions of dollars by some point, um, people didn't recognize him. He would try to get a taxi on the street of New York and people would completely ignore him. And so he said he could have been me. It could have been me. He was completely distraught about these issues. So a lot of this graffiti and street art really connects um, with these sort of site-specific moments. Um, a lot of what Basquiat was doing, though, later in his life um, that were on transportable canvases, so not necessarily site-specific. Keith Haring also responded to this Michael Stewart um, death. So this is a work that I have um, by him. This is USA for Africa from 1985. Keith Haring was much more um, of a site-specific artist, I would say. A lot of his famous work um, was produced in very specific places. So originally when he started doing his work, it was in the subway stations and he would find sort of these spaces um, where advertisements hadn't gone up yet and he would go in with chalk um, or white paint and then he would create these works that were very um, ephemeral because they would later be covered up right with um, a piece of advertising but he said I kept seeing more and more of these black spaces and I drew on them whenever I saw one because they were so fragile people left them alone and respected them they didn't rub them out or try to mess them up it gave them this other power it was this chalk white fragile thing in the middle of all this power and tension and violence that the subway was people were completely enthralled so he started creating a lot of different work um, some of them being billboards and others paintings and murals on buildings. He also was getting really famous for working with artists like Grace Jones and Madonna. Um, I have included a video um, of Grace Jones singing where Keith Haring has designed a dress for her in this music video. Keith Haring would also go to um, paint the Berlin Wall in 1986 um, and sort of talk about human rights and the connection um, that Germany had still had this wall up at the time. And so um, he painted this work on uh, the Berlin Wall before it came down in 1989 to sort of talk about the human rights violations that occurred by the building of this wall, um, separating the West and East um, German areas. He also produced this mural, which is Crack is Whack. He painted it in a park um, not being commissioned to do it originally, um, but after um, one of his friends had died um, because of a drug overdose. And so he painted and used this space that was in a park um, because of its location next to a highway that people would see it as they drove by. And so he um, additionally other kids would come and play there. I think it was near like a basketball court. And so it was a great space to sort of interact with the people there um, in the park as well as sort of the passing cars. So he interacted with the kids and sort of talked about, to them about um, drugs and sort of um, things that people have been suffering from at the time. Um, I have a video of the restoration of the work. It's still there. Um, people continue to sort of protect it. Finally, um, Keith Haring was diagnosed uh, with HIV in, I believe, 1988, and he started working with uh, AIDS activism in New York City at the time, um, which was a large issue um, in New York City, if you don't have a good idea of what was going on. Um, AIDS and HIV was sort of becoming a pandemic in New York City and a lot of um, homosexual men were dying and people didn't know a lot about AIDS and HIV at the time and so there was a lot of um, misinformation about how it was being spread and so there was a lot of fear and a lot of deaths um, in New York City at the time and so Keith Haring um, worked with ACT UP to produce different protests in New York City um, in which he fought um, against some of these stereotypes about AIDS um, because many people believe that it was caused by homosexuality or you could only get it if you were homosexual but at the same time um, people thought you could just give someone a handshake and you would get um, HIV which is ridiculous so 
really talking about a lot of these intro, um, these problems central to the sort of AIDS um, scene in New York City at the time. And using things like the pink triangle, um, the pink triangle upside down, so facing the other way, um, was a symbol that um, Nazis put on homosexuals in concentration camps. And so they retook this um, image and flipped it the other way to sort of use it in these protests. Unfortunately, Keith Haring did die um, of an AIDS-related disease or illness, um, I believe in 89 or 90, um, pretty early in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. So I know that was a lot of information, and I'm sorry if my brain seems a little phased out this week. I think it's a little too much time spent at home um, sitting in the same room day after day. Um, but I hope that you guys are excited about moving in to hear sort of some contemporary art uh, theories next week. Um, you don't have any official assignments for next week other than to keep working on your major projects. Um, and um, we're coming up on the third one here shortly. But um, I am including a extra credit assignment. So I will be posting a prompt um, for this Rivers and Tides documentary in which you can watch Andy Goldsworthy create land art and earthworks. I would recommend that you watch it um, regardless and I wish we could sort of just do that instead of having all these long lectures because it's such um, a powerful way of understanding land art and earth art. So if you have time and you feel like your grade might be suffering, go ahead and watch this video and then do the reading response or the response that is to this documentary for extra credit. So next week we'll be moving into performance art and body art and the rise of feminism, which are some of my favorite topics. I'm really excited. So uh, email me with any questions and concerns. Otherwise, I will see you next week.